Time's Arrow. First published in Science Fantasy, summer 1950. Collected in Reach for Tomorrow. Time's Arrow is an example of how hard it is for the science fiction writer to keep ahead of fact. The quite, at the time, imaginary discovery described in the tale now actually exists and may be seen in the New York Natural History Museum. I think it most unlikely, however, that the rest will come true. The river was dead and the lake already dying when the monster had come down the dried up water course and turned onto the desolate mud flats. There were not many places where it was safe to walk, and even where the ground was hardest, the great pistons of its feet sank a foot or more beneath the weight they carried. Sometimes it had paused, surveying the landscape with quick bird like movements of its head. Then it had sunk even deeper into the yielding soil, so that fifty million years later, men could judge with some accuracy the duration of its halts. For the waters had never returned, and the blazing sun had baked the mud to rock. Later still, the desert had poured over all this land, sealing it beneath protecting layers of sand. And later, very much later, had come man. Do you think, shouted Barton above the din, that Professor Fowler became a paleontologist because he likes playing with pneumatic drills? Or did he acquire the taste afterward? Can't hear you, yelled Davis, leaning on his shovel in a most professional manner. He glanced hopefully at his watch. Shall I tell him it's dinner time? He can't wear a watch while he's drilling, so he won't know any better. I doubt if it'll work, Barton shrieked. He's got wise to us now and always adds an extra 10 minutes, but it will make a change from this infernal digging. With noticeable enthusiasm, the two geologists downed tools and started to walk toward their chief. As they approached, he shut off the drill and relative silence descended, broken only by the throbbing of the compressor in the background. About time we went back to camp, Professor, said Davis, wristwatch held casually behind his back. You know what Cook says if we're late. Professor Fowler, M.A., F.R.S., F.G.S., mopped some, but by no means all, of the ochre dust from his forehead. He would have passed anywhere as a typical navvy and the occasional visitors to the site seldom recognized the vice president of the Geological Society in the brawny, half-naked workman crouching over his beloved pneumatic drill. It had taken nearly a month to clear the sandstone down to the surface of the petrified mud flats. In that time, several hundred square feet had been exposed, revealing a frozen snapshot of the past that was probably the finest yet discovered by paleontology. Some score of birds and reptiles had come here in search of the receding water and left their footsteps as a perpetual monument, eons after their bodies had perished. Most of the prints had been identified, but one, the largest of them all, was new to science. It belonged to a beast which must have weighed 20 or 30 tons, and Professor Fowler was following the 50 million year old spoor with all the emotions of a big game hunter tracking his prey. There was even a hope that he might yet overtake it, for the ground must have been treacherous when the unknown monster went this way, and its bones might still be near at hand, marking the place where it had been trapped like so many creatures of its time. Despite the mechanical aids available, the work was very tedious. Only the upper layers could be removed by the power tools, and the final uncovering had to be done by hand with the utmost care. Professor Fowler had good reason for his insistence that he alone should do the preliminary drilling, for a single slip might cause irreparable harm. The three men were halfway back to the main camp, jolting over the rough road in the expedition's battered jeep, when Davis raised the question that had been intriguing the younger men ever since the work had begun. I'm getting a distinct impression, he said, that our neighbors down the valley don't like us, though I can't imagine why. We're not interfering with them, and they might at least have the decency to invite us over. Unless, of course, it's a war research plant, added Barton, voicing a generally accepted theory. I don't think so, said Professor Fowler mildly, because it so happens that I've just had an invitation myself. I'm going there tomorrow. If his bombshell failed to have the expected result, it was thanks to his staff's efficient espionage system. For a moment, Davis pondered over this confirmation of his suspicions. Then he continued with a slight cough. <coughs> No one else has been invited then? The professor smiled at his pointed hint. No, he said. 
It's a strictly personal invitation. I know you boys are dying of curiosity, but frankly, I don't know any more about the place than you do. If I learn anything tomorrow, I'll tell you about it. But at least we found out who's running the establishment. His assistants pricked up their ears. Who, who is it? asked Barton. My guess was the Atomic Development Authority. You may be right, said the professor. At any rate, Henderson and Barnes are in charge. This time, the bomb exploded effectively, so much so that Davis nearly drove the jeep off the road. Not that that made much difference, the road being what it was. Henderson and Barnes? In this godforsaken hole? That's right, said the professor gaily. The invitation was actually from Barnes. He apologized for not contacting us before, made the usual excuses, and wondered if I could drop in for a chat. Did he say what they're doing? No, not a hint. Barnes and Henderson, said Barton thoughtfully. I don't know much about them except that they're physicists. What's their particular racket? They're the experts on low-temperature physics, answered Davis. Henderson was director of the Cavendish for years. He wrote a lot of letters to Nature not so long ago. If I remember rightly, they were all about helium, too. Barton, who didn't like physicists and said so whenever possible, was not impressed. I don't even know what helium, too, is, he said smugly. What's more, I'm not at all sure that I want to. This was intended for Davis, who had once taken a physics degree in, as he explained, a moment of weakness. The moment had lasted for several years before he had drifted into geology by rather devious roots, and he was always harking back to his first love. It's a form of liquid helium that only exists at a few degrees above absolute zero. It's got the most extraordinary properties, but as far as I can see, none of them can explain the presence of two leading physicists in this corner of the globe. They had now arrived at the camp, and Davis brought the jeep to its normal crash halt in the parking space. He shook his head in annoyance as he bumped into the truck ahead with slightly more violence than usual. These tires are nearly through. Have the new ones come yet? Arrived in the copter this morning with a despairing note from Andrews hoping that you'd make them last a full fortnight this time. Good. I'll get them fitted this evening. The professor had been walking a little ahead. Now he dropped back to join his assistants. You needn't have hurried, Jim, he said glumly. It's corned beef again. It would be most unfair to say that Barton and Davis did less work because the professor was away. They probably worked a good deal harder than usual, since the native laborers required twice as much supervision in the chief's absence. But there was no doubt that they managed to find time for a considerable amount of extra talking. Ever since they had joined Professor Fowler, the two young geologists had been intrigued by the strange establishment five miles away down the valley. It was clearly a research organization of some type, and Davis had identified the tall stacks of an atomic power unit. That, of course, gave no clue to the work that was proceeding, but it did indicate its importance. There were still only a few thousand turbopiles in the world, and they were all reserved for major projects. There were dozens of reasons why two great scientists might have hidden themselves in this place. Most of the more hazardous atomic research was carried out as far as possible from civilization, and some had been abandoned altogether until laboratories in space could be set up. Yet it seemed odd that this work, whatever it was, should be carried out so close to what had now become the most important center of geological research in the world. It might, of course, be no more than a coincidence. Certainly the physicists had never shown any interest in their compatriots so near at hand. Davis was carefully chipping round one of the great footprints, while Barton was pouring liquid perspex into those already uncovered so that they could be preserved from harm in the transparent plastic. They were working in a somewhat absent-minded manner, for each was unconsciously listening for the sound of the jeep. Professor Fowler had promised to collect them when he returned from his visit, for the other vehicles were in use elsewhere, and they did not relish a two-mile walk back to the camp in the broiling sun. Moreover, they wanted to have any news as soon as possible. How many people said Barton suddenly. Do you think they have over there? Davis straightened himself up. Judging from the buildings, not more than a dozen or so. Then it might be a private affair, not an ADA project at all. Perhaps. Though it must have pretty considerable backing. Of course, Henderson and Barnes could get that on their reputations alone. That's where the physicists score, said Barton. They've only got to convince some war department that they're on the track of a new weapon 
and they can get a couple of million without any trouble. He spoke with some bitterness, for, like most scientists, he had strong views on this subject. Barton's views, indeed, were even more definite than usual, for he was a Quaker and had spent the last year of the war arguing with not unsympathetic tribunals. The conversation was interrupted by the roar and clatter of the jeep, and the two men ran over to meet the professor. Well, they cried simultaneously. Professor Fowler looked at them thoughtfully, his expression giving no hint of what was in his mind. Have a good day, he said at last. Come off it, chief, protested Davis. Tell us what you found out. The professor climbed out of the seat and dusted himself down. I'm sorry, boys, he said with some embarrassment. I can't tell you a thing. And that's flat. There were two united wails of protest, but he waved them aside. I've had a very interesting day, but I've had to promise not to say anything about it. Even now, I don't know exactly what's going on, but it's something pretty revolutionary. As revolutionary, perhaps, as atomic power. But Dr. Henderson is coming over tomorrow. See what you can get out of him. For a moment, both Barton and Davis were so overwhelmed by the sense of anticlimax that neither spoke. Barton was the first to recover. Well, surely there's a reason for this sudden interest in our activities. The professor thought this over for a moment. Yes, it uh, wasn't entirely a social call, he admitted. They think I may be able to help them. Now, no more questions unless you want to walk back to camp. Dr. Henderson arrived on the site in the middle of the afternoon. He was a stout elderly man, dressed rather incongruously in a dazzling white laboratory smock and very little else. Though the garb was eccentric, it was eminently practical in so hot a climate. Davis and Barton were somewhat distant when Professor Fowler introduced them. They still felt that they had been snubbed and were determined that their visitors should understand their feelings. But Henderson was so obviously interested in their work that they soon thawed, and the professor left them to show him round the excavations while he went to supervise the natives. The physicist was greatly impressed by the picture of the world's remote past that lay exposed before his eyes. For almost an hour, the two geologists took him over the workings yard by yard, talking of the creatures who had gone this way and speculating about future discoveries. The track which Professor Fowler was following now lay in a wide trench, running away from the main excavation, for he had dropped all other work to investigate it. At its end, the trench was no longer continuous. To save time, the professor had begun to sink pits along the line of the footprints. The last sounding had missed altogether and further digging had shown that the great reptile had made a sudden change of course. This is the most interesting bit, said Barton to the slightly wilting physicist. You remember those earlier places where it had stopped for a moment to have a look around? Well, here it seems to have spotted something and has gone off in a new direction at a run, as you can see from the spacing. I shouldn't have thought such a brute could run. Well, it was probably a pretty clumsy effort, but you can cover quite a bit of ground with a 15-foot stride. We're going to follow it as far as we can. We may even find what it was chasing. I think the professor has hopes of discovering a trampled battlefield with the bones of the victim still around. That would make everyone sit up. Dr. Henderson smiled. Thanks to Walt Disney, I can picture the scene rather well. Davis was not very encouraging. It was probably only the missus banging the dinner gong, he said. The most infuriating part of our work is the way everything can peter out when it gets most exciting. The strata have been washed away, or there's been an earthquake, or, worse still, some silly fool has smashed up the evidence because he didn't recognize its value. Henderson nodded in agreement. Mm, I can sympathize with you, he said. That's where the physicist has the advantage. He knows he'll get the answer eventually, if there is one. He paused rather diffidently, as if weighing his words with great care. It would save you a lot of trouble, wouldn't it, if you could actually see what took place in the past without having to infer it by these laborious and uncertain methods. You've been a couple of months following these footsteps for a hundred yards, and they may lead nowhere for all your trouble. There was a long silence. Then Barton spoke in a very thoughtful voice. Naturally, Doctor, um, we're rather curious about your work he began. Since Professor Fowler won't tell us anything, we've done a good deal of speculating. D do you really mean to say that the physicist interrupted him rather hastily? Don't give it any more thought, he said. I was only daydreaming. As for our work, it's a very long way from completion, but 
you'll hear all about it in due course. We're not secretive, but like everyone working in a new field, we don't want to say anything until we're sure of our ground. Why, if any other paleontologist came near this place, I, I bet Professor Fowler would chase them away with a pickaxe. That's uh, not quite true, smiled Davis. He'd be much more likely to set them to work. But um, I see your point of view. Let's hope we don't have to wait too long. That night, much midnight oil was burned at the main camp. Barton was frankly skeptical, but Davis had already built up an elaborate superstructure of theory around their visitors' remarks. It would explain so many things, he said. First of all, their presence in this place, which otherwise doesn't make sense at all. We know the ground level here to within an inch for the last hundred million years, and we can date any event with an accuracy of better than one percent. There's not a spot on Earth that's had its past worked out in such detail. It's the obvious place for an experiment like this. But do you think it's even theoretically possible to build a machine that can see into the past? I can't imagine how it could be done, but I daren't say it's impossible, especially to men like Henderson and Barnes. Hmm, huh. not a very convincing argument. Is there any way we can hope to test it? What about those letters to nature? I've sent to the college library. We should have them by the end of the week. There's always some continuity in a scientist's work, and they may give us some valuable clues. But at first, they were disappointed indeed. Henderson's letters only increased the confusion. As Davis had remembered, most of them had been about the extraordinary properties of helium-2. It's really fantastic stuff, said Davis. If a liquid behaved like this at normal temperatures, everyone would go mad. In the first place, it hasn't any viscosity at all. Sir George Darwin once said that if you had an ocean of helium-2, ships could sail in it without any engines. You'd give them a push at the beginning of their voyage and let them run into buffers on the other side. There'd be one snag, though. Long before that happened, the stuff would have climbed straight up the hull and the whole outfit would have sunk. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. Very amusing, said Barton. But what the heck has this to do with your precious theory? Not much, admitted Davis. However, there's more to come. It's possible to have two streams of helium-2 flowing in opposite directions in the same tube, one stream going through the other, as it were. That must take a bit of explaining. It's almost as bad as an object moving in two directions at once. I suppose there is an explanation, something to do with relativity, I bet. Davis was reading carefully. The explanation, he said slowly, is very complicated, and I don't pretend to understand it fully, but it depends on the fact that liquid helium can have negative entropy under certain conditions. As I never understood what positive entropy is, I'm not much wiser. Entropy is a measure of the heat distribution of the universe. At the beginning of time, when all energy was concentrated in the suns, entropy was a minimum. It will reach its maximum when everything's at a uniform temperature and the universe is dead. There will still be plenty of heat around, but it won't be usable. Why ever not? Well, all the water in a perfectly flat ocean, won't run a hydroelectric plant. But quite a little lake up in the hills will do the trick. You, you must have a difference in level. I, I, I get the idea. Now I come to think of it. Didn't someone once call entropy time's arrow? Yes, Eddington, I believe. Any kind of clock you care to mention, a pendulum, for instance, might just as easily run forward as backward. But entropy is a strictly one-way affair. It's always increasing with the passage of time, hence the expression, time's arrow. The negative entropy, my gosh. For a moment, the two men looked at each other, then Barton asked in a rather subdued voice, what does Henderson say about it? I'll quote from his last letter. The discovery of negative entropy introduces quite new and revolutionary conceptions into our picture of the physical world. Some of these will be examined in a further communication. And are they? Well, that's the snag. There's no further communication. From that, you can guess two alternatives. First, the editor of Nature may have declined to publish the letter. I think we can rule that one out. Second, the consequences may have been so revolutionary that Henderson never did write a further report. Negative entropy. Negative time, mused Barton. It seems fantastic. 
it might be theoretically possible to build some sort of device that could see into the past. I know what we'll do, said Davis suddenly. We'll tackle the professor about it and watch his reactions. Now I'm going to bed before I get brain fever. That night, Davis did not sleep well. He dreamed that he was walking along a road that stretched in both directions as far as the eye could see. He had been walking for miles before he came to the signpost, and when he reached it, he found that it was broken, and the two arms were revolving idly in the wind. As they turned, he could read the words they carried. One said simply, to the future. The other, to the past. They learned nothing from Professor Fowler, which was not surprising. Next to the dean, he was the best poker player in the college. He regarded his slightly fretful assistance with no trace of emotion while Davis trotted out his theory. When the young man had finished, he said quietly, I'm going over again tomorrow, and I'll tell Henderson about your detective work. Maybe he'll take pity on you. Maybe he'll tell me a bit more, for that matter. Now, let's go to work. Davis and Barton found it increasingly difficult to take a great deal of interest in their own work while their minds were filled with the enigma so near at hand. Nevertheless, they continued conscientiously, though ever and again they paused to wonder if all their labor might not be in vain. If it were they would be the first to rejoice, supposing one could see into the past and watch history unfolding itself back to the dawn of time. All the great secrets of the past would be revealed. One could watch the coming of life on the earth and the whole story of evolution from amoeba to man. No, it was too good to be true. Having decided this, they would go back to their digging and scraping for another half hour until the thought would come, but what if it were true? and then the whole cycle would begin all over again. When Professor Fowler returned from his second visit, he was a subdued and obviously shaken man. The only satisfaction his assistants could get from him was the statement that Henderson had listened to their theory and complimented them on their powers of deduction. That was all. But in Davis's eyes, it clinched the matter, though Barton was still doubtful. In the weeks that followed, he too began to waver until at last they were both convinced that the theory was correct, for Professor Fowler was spending more and more of his time with Henderson and Barnes, so much so that they sometimes did not see him for days. He'd almost lost interest in the excavations and had delegated all responsibility to Barton, who was now able to use the big pneumatic drill to his heart's content. They were uncovering several yards of footprints a day, and the spacing showed that the monster had now reached its utmost speed and was advancing in great leaps as if nearing its victim. In a few days, they might reveal the evidence of some eon-old tragedy, preserved by a miracle and brought down the ages for the observation of man. Yet all this seemed very unimportant now, for it was clear from the professor's hints and his general air of abstraction that the secret research was nearing its climax. He had told them as much, promising that in a very few days, if all went well, their wait would be ended. But beyond that, he would say nothing. Once or twice Henderson had paid them a visit, and they could see that he was now laboring under a considerable strain. He obviously wanted to talk about his work, but was not going to do so until the final tests had been completed. They could only admire his self-control and wish that it would break down. Davis had a distinct impression that the elusive Barnes was mainly responsible for his secrecy. He had something of a reputation for not publishing work until it had been checked and double-checked. If these experiments were as important as they believed, his caution was understandable, however infuriating. Henderson had come over early that morning to collect the professor, and as luck would have it, his car had broken down on the primitive road. This was unfortunate for Davis and Barton, who would have to walk to camp for lunch, since Professor Fowler was driving Henderson back in the Jeep. They were quite prepared to put up with this if their wait was indeed coming to an end, as the others had more than half hinted. They had stood talking by the side of the jeep for some time before the two older scientists had driven away. It was a rather strained parting, for each side knew what the other was thinking. Finally, Barton, as usual, the most outspoken, remarked, Well, Doc, if this is their tog, I hope everything works properly. I'd like a photograph of a brontosaurus as a souvenir. This sort of banter had been thrown at Henderson so often that he now took it for granted. He smiled without much mirth and replied, I don't promise anything. It may be the biggest flop ever. Davis moodily checked the tire pressure with the toe of his boot. It was a new set, he noticed, 
with an odd zigzag pattern he hadn't seen before. Well, whatever happens, we hope you'll tell us. Otherwise, we're going to break in one night and find out just what you're up to. Henderson laughed. You'll be a pair of geniuses if you can learn anything from our present lash-up. But if all goes well, we may be having a little celebration by nightfall. What time do you expect to be back, Chief? Somewhere around four. I don't want you to have to walk back for tea. Okay, here's hoping. The machine disappeared in a cloud of dust, leaving two very thoughtful geologists standing by the roadside. Then Barton shrugged his shoulders. The harder we work, he said, the quicker the time will go. Come along. The end of the trench where Barton was working with the power drill was now more than a hundred yards from the main excavation. Davis was putting the final touches to the last prints to be uncovered. They were now very deep and widely spaced, and looking along them, one could see quite clearly where the great reptile had changed its course and started first to run and then to hop like an enormous kangaroo. Barton wondered what it must have felt like to see such a creature bearing down upon one with the speed of an express. Then he realized that if their guess was true, this was exactly what they might soon be seeing. By mid-afternoon, they had uncovered a record length of track. The ground had become softer, and Barton was roaring ahead so rapidly that he had almost forgotten his other preoccupations. He had left Davis yards behind, and both men were so busy that only the pangs of hunger reminded them when it was time to finish. Davis was the first to notice that it was later than they had expected, and he walked over to speak to his friend. It's nearly half past four, he said, when the noise of the drill had died away. The chief's late. I'll be, I'll be mad if he's had tea before collecting us. Give him another half hour, said Barton. I can guess what's happened. They've blown a fuse or something, and it's upset their schedule. Davis refused to be placated. I'll be darned annoyed if we've got to walk back to camp again. Anyway, I'm going up the hill to see if there's any sign of him. He left Barton blasting his way through the soft rock and climbed the low hill at the side of the old riverbed. From here, one could see far down the valley and the twin stacks of the Henderson Barnes Laboratory were clearly visible against the drab landscape. There was no sign of the moving dust cloud that would be following the jeep. The professor had not yet started for home. Davis gave a snort of disgust. It was a two-mile walk ahead of them after a particularly tiring day, and to make matters worse, they'd now be late for tea. He decided not to wait any longer and was already walking down the hill to rejoin Barton when something caught his eye, and he stopped to look down the valley. Around the two stacks, which were all he could see of the laboratory, a curious haze, not unlike a heat tremor, was playing. They must be hot, he knew, but surely not that hot. He looked more carefully and saw to his amazement that the haze covered a hemisphere that must be almost a quarter of a mile across. And quite suddenly, it exploded. There was no light, no blinding flash only a ripple that spread abruptly across the sky and then was gone. The haze had vanished, and so had the two great stacks of the powerhouse. Feeling as though his legs had turned suddenly to water, Davis slumped down upon the hilltop and stared open-mouthed along the valley. A sense of overwhelming disaster swept into his mind, as in a dream he waited for the explosion to reach his ears. It was not impressive when it came, only a dull, long, drawn-out whoosh that died away swiftly in the still air. Half unconsciously, Davis noticed that the chatter of the drill had also stopped. The explosion must have been louder than he thought for Barton to have heard it, too. The silence was complete. Nothing moved anywhere as far as his eye could see in the whole of that empty, barren landscape. He waited until his strength returned, then, half running, he went unsteadily down the hill to rejoin his friend. Barton was half sitting in the trench with his head buried in his hands. He looked up as Davis approached, and although his features were obscured by dust and sand, the other was shocked at the expression in his eyes. So you heard it too, Davis said. I think the whole lab's blown up. Come along, for heaven's sake. Heard, heard what? said Barton dully. Davis stared at him in amazement. Then he realized that Barton could not possibly have heard any sound while he was working with the drill. The sense of disaster deepened with a rush. He felt like a character in some Greek tragedy, helpless before an implacable doom. Barton rose to his feet. 
His face was working strangely, and Davis saw that he was on the verge of a breakdown. Yet when he spoke, his words were surprisingly calm. What fools we were, he said. How Henderson must have laughed at us when we told him that he was trying to see into the past. Mechanically, Davis moved to the trench and stared at the rock that was seeing the light of day for the first time in 50 million years. Without much emotion now, he traced again the zigzag pattern he had first noticed a few hours before. It had sunk only a little way into the mud, as if when it was formed, the jeep had been traveling at its utmost speed. No doubt it had been, for in one place, the shallow tire marks had been completely obliterated by the monster's footprints. They were now very deep indeed, as if the great reptile was about to make the final leap upon its desperately fleeing prey. The Sentinel, first published in Ten Story Fantasy, Spring 1951, as Sentinel of Eternity, collected in Expedition to Earth. The Sentinel was written over Christmas 1948 for a BBC competition. It wasn't even placed. I have often wondered what did win. I am amused to see that I put the exploration of the Mare Crisium in the late summer of 1996. Well, we missed that date, but I hope we'll get there early in the next century. This is the starting point of 2001, A Space Odyssey. The next time you see the full moon high in the south, look carefully at its right-hand edge and let your eye travel upwards along the curve of the disk. Round about two o'clock, you will notice a small dark oval. Anyone with normal eyesight can find it quite easily. It is the Great Walled Plain, one of the finest on the moon, known as the Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises, 300 miles in diameter and almost completely surrounded by a ring of magnificent mountains. It had never been explored until we entered it in the late summer of 1996. Our expedition was a large one. We had uh, two heavy freighters, which had flown our supplies and equipment from the main lunar base in the Mare Serenitatis, 500 miles away. Uh, there were also three small rockets, which were intended for short-range transport over regions which our surface vehicles could not cross. Luckily, most of the Mare Crisium is very flat. There are none of the great crevasses so common and so dangerous elsewhere, and very few craters or mountains of any size. As far as we could tell, our powerful caterpillar tractors would have no difficulty in taking us wherever we wished. I was geologist, or selenologist, if you want to be pedantic, in charge of the group exploring the southern region of the Mare. We had crossed a hundred miles of it in a week, skirting the foothills of the mountains along the shore of what was once the ancient sea some thousand million years before. When life was beginning on earth, it was already dying here. The waters were retreating down the flanks of those stupendous cliffs, retreating into the empty heart of the moon. Over the land which we were crossing, the tideless ocean had once been half a mile deep, and now the only trace of moisture was the hoar frost one could sometimes find in caves which the searing sunlight never penetrated. We had begun our journey early in the slow lunar dawn and still had almost a week of earth time before nightfall. Half a dozen times a day we would leave our vehicle and go outside in the spacesuits to hunt for interesting minerals or to place markers for the guidance of future travelers. It was an uneventful routine. There is nothing hazardous or even particularly exciting about lunar exploration. We could live comfortably for a month in our pressurized tractors, and if we ran into trouble, we could always radio for help and sit tight until one of the spaceships came to our rescue. When that happened, there was always a frightful outcry about the waste of rocket fuel, so a tractor sent out an SOS only in a real emergency. I said just now that there was nothing exciting about lunar exploration, but of course that is not true. One could never grow tired of those incredible mountains, so much more rugged than the gentle hills of earth. We never knew as we rounded the capes and promontories of that vanished sea what new splendors would be revealed to us. 
the whole southern curve of the Mare Crisium is a vast delta where a score of rivers had once found their way into the ocean, fed perhaps by the torrential rains that must have lashed the mountains in the brief volcanic age when the moon was young. Each of these ancient valleys was an invitation, challenging us to climb into the unknown uplands beyond. But we had a hundred miles still to cover, and could only look longingly at the heights which others must scale. We kept Earth time aboard the tractor, and precisely at 2200 hours the final radio message would be sent out to base, and we could close down for the day. Outside, the rocks would still be burning beneath the almost vertical sun, but to us it was night until we awoke again eight hours later. Then one of us would prepare breakfast. There would be a great buzzing of electric shavers, and someone would switch on the shortwave radio from Earth. Indeed, when the smell of frying bacon began to fill the cabin, it was sometimes hard to believe that we were not back on our own world. Everything was so normal and homely, apart from the feeling of decreased weight and the unnatural slowness with which objects fell. It was my turn to prepare breakfast in the corner of the main cabin that served as a galley. I can remember that moment quite vividly after all these years, for the radio had just played one of my favorite melodies, the old Welsh air, David of the White Rock. Our driver was already outside in his spacesuit inspecting our caterpillar treads. My assistant, Louis Garnett, was up forward in the control position making some belated entries in yesterday's log. As I stood by the frying pan, waiting, like any terrestrial housewife, for the sausages to brown, I let my gaze wander idly over the mountain walls which covered the whole of the southern horizon, marching out of sight to the east and west below the curve of the moon. They seemed only a mile or two from the tractor, but I knew that the nearest was twenty miles away. On the moon, of course, there is no loss of detail with distance, none of that almost imperceptible haziness which softens and sometimes transfigures all far-off things on Earth. Those mountains were 10,000 feet high, and they climbed steeply out of the plain, as if ages ago some subterranean eruption had smashed them skywards through the molten crust. The base of even the nearest was hidden from sight by the steeply curving surface of the plain, for the moon is a very little world, and from where I was standing, the horizon was only two miles away. I lifted my eyes towards the peaks which no man had ever climbed, the peaks which before the coming of terrestrial life had watched the retreating oceans sink sullenly into their graves, taking with them the hope and the morning promise of a world. The sunlight was beating against those ramparts with a glare that hurt the eyes, yet only a little way above them the stars were shining steadily in a sky blacker than a winter midnight on earth. I was turning away when my eye caught a metallic glitter high on the ridge of a great promontory thrusting out into the sea thirty miles to the west. It was a dimensionless point of light, as if a star had been clawed from the sky by one of those cruel peaks, and I imagined that some smooth rock surface was catching the sunlight and heliographing it straight into my eyes. Such things were not uncommon. When the moon is in her second quarter, observers on Earth can sometimes see the great ranges in the Oceanus Procellarum burning with a blue-white iridescence as the sunlight flashes from their slopes and leaps again from world to world. But I was curious to know what kind of rock could be shining so brightly up there, and I climbed into the observation turret and swung our four-inch telescope round to the west. I could see just enough to tantalize me. Clear and sharp in the field of vision, the mountain peaks seemed only half a mile away. But whatever was catching the sunlight was still too small to be resolved. Yet it seemed to have an elusive symmetry, and the summit upon which it rested was curiously flat. I stared for a long time at that glittering enigma straining my eyes into space until presently a smell of burning from the galley told me that our breakfast sausages had made their quarter-million-mile journey in vain. All that morning we argued our way across the Mare Crisium while the western mountains reared higher in the sky. Even when we were out prospecting in the spacesuits, the discussion would continue over the radio. It was absolutely certain, my companions argued, that 
that there had never been any form of intelligent life on the moon. The only living things that had ever existed there were a few primitive plants and their slightly less degenerate ancestors. I knew that as well as anyone, but there are times when a scientist must not be afraid to make a fool of himself. Listen, I said at last, I'm going up there, if only for my own peace of mind. That mountain's less than 12,000 feet high. That's only 2,000 under Earth's gravity, and I can make the trip in 20 hours at the outside. I've always wanted to go up into those hills anyway, and this gives me an excellent excuse. If you don't break your neck, said Garnett, you'll be the laughing stock of the expedition when we get back to base. That mountain will probably be called Wilson's Folly from now on. I won't break my neck, I said firmly. Who was the first man to climb Pico and Helicon? Weren't you rather younger in those days, asked Lewis gently. That, I said with great dignity, is as good a reason as any for going. We went to bed early that night, after driving the tractor to within a half mile of the promontory. Garnett was coming with me in the morning. He was a good climber and had often been with me on such exploits before. Our driver was only too glad to be left in charge of the machine. At first sight, those cliffs seemed completely unscalable. But to anyone with a good head for heights, climbing is easy on a world where all weights are only a sixth of their normal value. The real danger in lunar mountaineering lies in overconfidence. A 600-foot drop on the moon can kill you just as thoroughly as a 100-foot fall on Earth. We made our first halt on a wide ledge about 4,000 feet above the plain. Climbing had not been very difficult, but my limbs were stiff with the unaccustomed effort, and I was glad of the rest. We could still see the tractor as a tiny metal insect far down at the foot of the cliff, and we reported our progress to the driver before starting on the next ascent. Hour by hour, the horizon widened, and more and more of the great plain came into sight. Now we could look for 50 miles out across the mare, and could even see the peaks of the mountains on the opposite coast more than a 100 miles away. Few of the great lunar plains are as smooth as the Mare Crisium, and we could almost imagine that a sea of water and not of rock was lying there two miles below. Only a group of crater pits low down on the skyline spoiled the illusion. Our goal was still invisible over the crest of the mountain, and we were steering by maps, using the earth as a guide. Almost due east of us, that great silver crescent hung low over the plain, already well into its first quarter. The sun and the stars would make their slow march across the sky and would sink presently from sight, but Earth would always be there, never moving from her appointed place, waxing and waning as the years and seasons passed. In ten days' time she would be a blinding disk bathing these rocks with her midnight radiance, fifty-fold brighter than the full moon. But we must be out of the mountains long before night, or else we would remain among them forever. Inside our suits it was comfortably cool, for the refrigeration units were fighting the fierce sun and carrying away the body heat of our exertion. We seldom spoke to each other except to pass climbing instructions and to discuss our best plan of ascent. I do not know what Garnett was thinking, probably that this was the craziest goose chase he had ever embarked upon. I more than half agreed with him, but the joy of climbing, the knowledge that no man had ever gone this way before, and the exhilaration of the steadily widening landscape gave me all the reward I needed. I do not think I was particularly excited when I saw in front of us the wall of rock I had first inspected through the telescope from 30 miles away. It would level off about 50 feet above our heads, and there on the plateau would be the thing that had lured me over these barren wastes. It was almost certainly nothing more than a boulder splintered ages ago by a falling meteor, and with its cleavage planes still fresh and bright in this incorruptible, unchanging silence. There were no handholds on the rock face, and we had to use a grapnel. My tired arms seemed to gain new strength as I swung the three-pronged metal anchor around my head and sent it sailing up toward the stars. The first time it broke loose and came falling slowly back when we pulled the rope. On the third attempt, the prongs gripped firmly, and our combined weights could not shift it. Garnett looked at me anxiously. I could tell that he wanted to go first, but I smiled back at him through the glass of my helmet 
and shook my head. Slowly, taking my time, I began the final ascent. Even with my space suit, I weighed only 40 pounds here, so I pulled myself up hand over hand without bothering to use my feet. At the rim, I paused and waved to my companion. Then I scrambled over the edge and stood upright, staring ahead of me. You must understand that until this very moment I had been almost completely convinced that there could be nothing strange or unusual for me to find here. Almost, but not quite. It was that haunting doubt that had driven me forwards. Well, it was a doubt no longer, but the haunting had scarcely begun. I was standing on a plateau perhaps a hundred feet across. It had once been smooth, too smooth to be natural, but falling meteors had pitted and scored its surface through immeasurable eons. It had been leveled to support a glittering, roughly pyramidal structure, twice as high as a man, that was set in the rock like a gigantic, many-faceted jewel. Probably no emotion at all filled my mind in those first few seconds. Then I felt a great lifting of my heart and a strange, inexpressible joy. For I loved the moon, and now I knew that the creeping moss of Aristarchus and Eratosthenes was not the only life she had brought forth in her youth. The old, discredited dream of the first explorers was true. There had, after all, been a lunar civilization, and I was the first to find it. That I had come perhaps a hundred million years too late did not distress me. It was enough to have come at all. My mind was beginning to function normally, to analyze and to ask questions. Was this a building, a shrine, or something for which my language had no name? If a building, then why was it erected in so uniquely inaccessible a spot? I wondered if it might be a temple, and I could picture the adepts of some strange priesthood calling on their gods to preserve them as the life of the moon ebbed with the dying oceans and calling on their gods in vain. I took a dozen steps forward to examine the thing more closely, but some sense of caution kept me from going too near. I knew a little of archaeology and tried to guess the cultural level of the civilization that must have smoothed and dismounted and raised the glittering mirror surfaces that still dazzled my eyes. The Egyptians could have done it, I thought, if their workmen had possessed whatever strange materials these far more ancient architects had used. Because of the thing's smallness, it did not occur to me that I might be looking at the handiwork of a race more advanced than my own. The idea that the moon had possessed intelligence at all was still almost too tremendous to grasp, and my pride would not let me take the final humiliating plunge. And then I noticed something that set the scalp crawling at the back of my neck. Something so trivial and so innocent that many would never have noticed it at all. Now I have said that the plateau was scarred by meteors. It was also coated inches deep with the cosmic dust that is always filtering down upon the surface of any world where there are no winds to disturb it. Yet the dust and the meteor scratches ended quite abruptly in a wide circle enclosing the little pyramid as though an invisible wall was protecting it from the ravages of time and the slow but ceaseless bombardment from space. There was someone shouting in my earphones, and I realized that Garnett had been calling me for some time. I walked unsteadily to the edge of the cliff and signaled him to join me, not trusting myself to speak. Then I went back towards that circle in the dust. I picked up a fragment of splintered rock and tossed it gently toward the shining enigma. If the pebble had vanished at that invisible barrier, I should not have been surprised. But it seemed to hit a smooth, hemispherical surface and slide gently to the ground. I knew then that I was looking at nothing that could be matched in the antiquity of my own race. This was not a building, but a machine, protecting itself with forces that had challenged eternity. Those forces, whatever they might be, were still operating and perhaps I had already come too close. I thought of all the radiations man had trapped and tamed in the past century. For all I knew, 
I might be as irrevocably doomed as if I had stepped into the deadly silent aura of an unshielded atomic pile. I remember turning then towards Garnett, who had joined me and was now standing motionless at my side. He seemed quite oblivious of me, so I did not disturb him, but walked to the edge of the cliff in an effort to marshal my thoughts. There below me lay the Mare Crisium, a sea of crises indeed, strange and weird to most men, but reassuringly familiar to me. I lifted my eyes towards the crescent earth lying in her cradle of stars, and I wondered what her clouds had covered when these unknown builders had finished their work. Was it the steaming jungle of the Carboniferous, the bleak shoreline over which the first amphibians must crawl to conquer the land, or earlier still the long loneliness before the coming of life? Do not ask me why I did not guess the truth sooner, the truth that seems so obvious now. In the first excitement of my discovery, I had assumed without question that this crystalline apparition had been built by some race belonging to the moon's remote past. But suddenly, and with overwhelming force, the belief came to me that it was as alien to the moon as I myself. In twenty years, we had found no trace of life but a few degenerate plants. No lunar civilization, whatever its doom could have left, but a single token of its existence. I looked at the shining pyramid again, and the more remote it seemed from anything that had to do with the moon. And suddenly I felt myself shaking with a foolish, hysterical laughter, brought on by excitement and overexertion, for I had imagined that the little pyramid was speaking to me and was saying, Sorry, I'm a stranger here myself. It has taken us twenty years to crack that invisible shield and to reach the machine inside those crystal walls. What we could not understand, we broke at last with the savage might of atomic power, and now I have seen the fragments of the lovely, glittering thing I found up there on the mountain. They are meaningless. The mechanisms, if indeed they are mechanisms, of the pyramid belong to a technology that lies far beyond our horizon perhaps to the technology of paraphysical forces. The mystery haunts us all the more now that the other planets have been reached and we know that only Earth has ever been the home of intelligent life. Nor could any lost civilization of our own world have built that machine, for the thickness of the meteoric dust on the plateau has enabled us to measure its age. It was set there upon its mountain before life had emerged from the seas of Earth. When our world was half its present age, something from the stars swept through the solar system, left this token of its passage, and went again upon its way. Until we destroyed it, that machine was still fulfilling the purpose of its builders, and as to that purpose, here is my guess. Nearly a hundred thousand million stars are turning in the circle of the Milky Way, and long ago other races on the worlds of other suns must have scaled and passed the heights that we have reached. Think of such civilizations far back in time against the fading afterglow of creation, masters of a universe so young that life as yet had come only to a handful of worlds. Theirs would have been a loneliness we cannot imagine, the loneliness of gods looking out across infinity and finding none to share their thoughts. They must have searched the star clusters as we have searched the planets. Everywhere there would be worlds, but they would be empty or peopled with crawling, mindless things. Such was our own Earth, the smoke of the great volcanoes still staining the skies when that first ship of the people of the dawn came sliding in from the abyss beyond Pluto. It passed the frozen outer worlds, knowing that life could play no part in their destinies. It came to rest among the inner planets, warming themselves around the fire of the sun and waiting for their stories to begin. Those wanderers must have looked on earth, circling safely in the narrow zone between fire and ice, and must have guessed that it was the favorite of the sun's children. Here in the distant future would be intelligence. But there were countless stars before them still, 
and they might never come this way again. So they left a sentinel, one of millions they have scattered throughout the universe, watching over all worlds with the promise of life. It was a beacon that down the ages has been patiently signaling the fact that no one had discovered it. Perhaps you understand now why that crystal pyramid was set upon the moon instead of on the earth. Its builders were not concerned with races still struggling up from savagery. They would be interested in our civilization only if we proved our fitness to survive by crossing space and so escaping from the earth our cradle. That is the challenge that all intelligent races must meet sooner or later. It is a double challenge, for it depends in turn upon the conquest of atomic energy and the last choice between life and death. Once we had passed that crisis, it was only a matter of time before we found the pyramid and forced it open. Now its signals have ceased, and those whose duty it is will be turning their minds upon earth. Perhaps they wish to help our infant civilization, but they must be very, very old, and the old are often insanely jealous of the young. I can never look now at the Milky Way without wondering from which of those banked clouds of stars the emissaries are coming. If you will pardon so commonplace a simile, we have broken the glass of the fire alarm and have nothing to do but to wait. I do not think we will have to wait for long.